The following program is recorded content created by the Truth Network. It's Matt Slick Live. Matt is the founder and president of the Christian Apologetics Research Ministry, found online at CARM.org. When you have questions about Bible doctrines, turn to Matt Slick Live for answers. Taking your calls and responding to your questions at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. All right, everyone. Hey, welcome to the show. It's me, Matt Slick. You're listening to Matt Slick Live. I hope you're all going to have a good time listening today. I've been out of the studio a little bit, was in Southern California at a conference and uh, spoke on Islam. And actually, I uh, I spoke on the issues of uh, Christian theology related to certain, you know, certain things. And I really enjoyed doing that. It was a lot of fun and some great folks there, some great folks. All right. Hey, look, we have nobody waiting. If you want to give me a call, all you have to do is dial 877-207-2276. Hope you can all hear me and uh, get all this stuff going. Ben, I'm always pushing the envelope, always pushing on what I've got to get done. I have so much to do all the time. All right. Now, I don't know if any of you are, who are listening or at the conference, um, you know, if you want, you can call in and say what you thought of the conference because it was, I thought it was really good. It was really good, and it was put on by Ministry to Muslims. And um, man, it, it was—they had people there who were saying things that were—it was just incredible. Some of the stuff, I was really impressed. Uh, I learned a lot, took a lot of notes, and was really blessed. Um, there are these guys there. Basically, I—I uh, um, I put it this way: my knowledge of Islam is basically nothing compared to what these guys know. A lot of the guys speak Arabic. They've lived in Arabic nations, uh, even as Americans, for years and years at a time, are familiar with the culture, have studied stuff, have learned just things that I'll just never learn. And uh, they were sharing insights, information, and it was really, really good. One of the more um, interesting things that I, I encountered there was a gentleman, uh, Dr. J, I believe it was, uh, who, he was Jay Smith, and he presented some stuff on the Quranic scriptures and Hadith scriptures or, or uh, sayings about when they were written and when's the earliest uh, manuscripts of them. And oh, oh wow, oh wow! Um, I want I need to get information and be able to uh, articulate it and learn it. Of course, give him credit because he did the research. But man, uh, the credibility of the Quran from what he was showing is exceedingly doubtful and the hadith exceedingly doubtful you, you can't you can't say that these things were uh, all that accurate from what uh, the evidence is really interesting stuff and i uh, really enjoyed it so hey look there you go and uh, if you want to give me a call the number is 8772072276 you have nobody waiting and um Let's see. So, here we go. So, there's a couple things we could talk about. One uh, is uh, what I talked about at the conference. And what I plan to do is to... Um, I plan to release the the PowerPoints and the doc, the Word document that I, I used uh, in the presentation. People were asking for it. So, what I think I'll do is just release it on CARM, I'm going to find a place to put it, to put these things. So I'm thinking of, what I'm thinking of, of doing is creating a section uh, on CARM just for PowerPoint uh, presentations. And where I'll put a lot of the PowerPoints that I've, I've developed over the years and just put them there for people's uh, use. They can, they can uh, check them out. So that's one of the theories or one of the options I'm working on right now about doing that. And we want people to be able to have access to that uh, that information. So, uh, whew, all right, there you go. So I spoke on the hypostatic union, the two natures of Christ. And then I also spoke on what did Christ do on the cross. Now, what I'd like to be able to do sometime at a conference is speak on for 40 minutes or 45 minutes I'd like to be able to speak on the doctrine of the Trinity and explain what it is explain how it is arrived at in scripture and then 
explain how when you presuppose the Trinity you can then make sense of the laws of logic of uh, moral absolutes our existence uh, the issue of the one and the many universals and particulars uh, and how the Trinity uh, can provide the basis for explaining and justifying all of them I would love to do a seminar on that and I could also do a tangent and show why Unitarianism doesn't work Binitarianism doesn't work and modal monarchianism doesn't work all while doing that that would be a good seminar what I would do is have a PowerPoint presentation and handout so people could follow along with the notes and get the information so that's that's a dream uh, I'm hoping will happen sometime all right so there you go so hey look we have nobody waiting right now I want you to give me a call 877 207 Two two seven six. I want to hear from you. After the uh, the conference, I, I preached at uh, two sermons on uh, at Calvary Chapel in Norco, and uh, it was great. The people there were great and uh, enjoyed doing that. And then afterwards, we went and had eight, and then I taught theology for two hours. People were asking me more questions. They were also at the seminar and the, the conference, and they went out to uh, hear me preach. And they uh, they said, let's get you know afterwards and talk. I said, I got a couple three hours before I have to be at the airport. And they said, yes, let's do that. So that was really a lot of fun to do as well. I love teaching. I love being able to explain the things of God and the truth of, of who God is and what he has done. So that was that. And um, I got radio questions. Oh, look at that. What is that? So someone just sends me a link and says, what do you think? Well, um, I don't know. Uh, I wish, you know, if people were going to, um, if people are going to, uh, you know, send me a question, I, I would prefer that they actually give me something that, um, you know, is in writing or stuff. They come and do this on the radio because, because I said radio question, and it's a video I have to watch. I can't do that on the air. So what I do with those in that case is I just hit delete because it doesn't work like that. So if you want to give me a call, 877-207-2276. If you want to email me a comment or a question for the radio show, you can do that by going to info at carm.org, info at carm.org, C-A-R-M dot O-R-G. And uh, put in the subject line radio comment or radio question, and then we can get to those. And that's what I'm looking at right now. So I think we'll get to that in a little bit. We've got a caller coming in, and we have three open lines. It's numbers 877-207-2276. Let's get to whew, Imez from Charlotte, North Carolina. Welcome. You're on the air. Thank you. No, I'm just confused. America is sitting out there in the ocean while Israel is being shredded by Hezbollah. Is, am I missing something? Uh, well, uh, would you have a question? No? Well, I don't know. Can you explain it to me? I mean, I, I don't understand. Is it something that I am missing or am not understanding? Well, is, I'm not sure. I don't know what you're understanding or not understanding. What's your, what's your question? Oh. All right, never mind. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All Thank right. You. Sure. Um, by the way, uh, the American ships are out there. Uh, now, I don't know what the question was, but they are supporting Israel. They're doing uh, asset uh, support. We have a, uh, I know that America has a strong alliance with Israel, and rightfully so. It's good. It doesn't mean everything that Israel does is right but at least we have uh, covenants with them and treaties with them and things like that. So the, the ships are providing uh, varying uh, areas of logistical support for the Israelis and along with intelligence gathering and things like that. So um, I don't, don't have to tell you beyond that. So hey, look, if you want to give me a call, the number is 877 
seven six. Now someone said in the email in Acts two thirty eight, when the crowd asked what they need to be saved, they were told to repent and be baptized. Now let's check this out. And it says the question is what they need to do to repent and be saved. Let's go and see if that's what the question was. Because um, in verse 36, Acts 2.36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Now it d doesn't say, what do we do to get saved? He just says, what do we do? And then Peter says, Repent, each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord God will call to himself. So the questioner says, in Acts 2.38, when the crowd asked what they need to do to be saved, but it doesn't say that in, the, in there. It doesn't say that. It's, it's really important. Now, some of them might say, well, that's what they're asking about. Well, maybe it is, but maybe it's not. Because um, they said, what do we do? In light of what? In light of the Holy Spirit's movement upon the Jews and the Gentiles. And he says, what do we do? They weren't sure what to do. And he says, be baptized, you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But the gift of the Holy Spirit is not salvation. The gift of the Holy Spirit is the charismatic work, the charismatic gifts. And it's referenced right there in Acts chapter 2, where uh, they were moving in the charismatic gifts and speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues, and tongues of fire were on them. And in Acts chapter 10, 44 through 48, uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured on them, for they were hearing them speaking with tongues. So it certainly seems to be the case that the gift of the Holy Spirit is the movement of the charismatic gifts. So that's why I don't say that Acts 2.38 is a, a verse about being saved. It's about something else. Now, most people don't hold that position, but that's what I see. The email goes on and says, But in Acts 13, uh, 16.31, the jailer guard was told to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. So let's go to Acts 16, 31, and we'll check it out, all right? We'll see what, always read the context, and don't assume that someone's question uh, is accurately asked reflecting of the text. Now in Acts 2, 36 through 38, it doesn't say to be saved, but could make the case that it's there? Could be, but it doesn't say that. So this is what it says in Acts 16, starting at verse 28. Paul cried out with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself. This is after the earthquake. The prison doors were open. He says, We're all here. And they called for the lights and rushed in. And trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. After he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now right there, that's what the question is. And then he says, Believe in the Lord Jesus, you'll be saved in you and your household. So there's no conflict here, because in Acts 2.38, it does not say to be saved. But it does say you'll receive the forgiveness of sins. So we can say, though, that with Acts 2.38, that when they're talking about this, Paul, I mean, Peter is saying, repent, each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, here's the question. Are you being baptized in order to obtain the forgiveness of sins? Or are you being baptized because you have the forgiveness of your sins? And you're, it's a recognition of that. And in that baptism, you receive the charismatic gifts. You see, this is the kind of stuff we have to ask. And there's the break. We write back, I mean, uh, ladies and gentlemen, right after these messages. Please stay tuned. It's Matt Slick Live, taking your calls at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. All right, everyone, welcome back to the show. Hope you're enjoying it. Hey, I just want to let you know that we are also now broadcasting on X or uh, Twitter. So uh, I went and took some stuff, took care of some stuff over the weekend that made that possible. So now you can watch us there as well, watch the radio show as well. Praise God for that. All right. Um, all right. So there we go. And I, I want you to give me a call, 877-207-2276. I want to hear from you. Give me a call. Now let's get back on to uh, some radio questions. A little bit slow right now. And what we'll do is get on 
and do some more uh, questions people have sent in. So this person who asked about Acts 2.38 and Acts uh, 16.31 goes on and says, I thought it was Jesus who justified us through faith in him. That is true. And as a result, we continue to turn to him and repent and live in obedience to him as, uh, as, the, Lord, as the Lord the rest of our lives. Is it wrong to believe in faith justifies us and not our repentance? Of course, that's correct. Repentance does not make us right before God. Uh, repentance is compliance with the law. God says, don't lie. So if you're lying and you find out, don't lie, you comply with that law, that's a repentance. But that's not what makes you right before God. The blood of Christ does that, not uh, not your repentance. Though so you should repent, okay? He goes on, he says, Acts 2.38 confuses me because the crowd was told to repent instead of believe. Well, let's go back to Acts 2.38 and uh, to remind uh, all of you about this issue because it is worth spending a little bit of time uh, on and about. It says, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, in the name of Jesus is a phrase that means in the authority of. That's what's going on there. And so let's get into um, some of the Greek. Uh, I'll talk about this a little bit so I can slow down a little. So some say that Acts 2.38 uh, is a proof text for salvation. Well, no, it's not. The phrase in Greek for the forgiveness of sins is ace aphesin hermartion. Ace aphesin hermartion. That exact same Greek phrase is found in Mark 1.4 and Luke 3.3. 3. They're found exactly there. In Mark 1.4, it says, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And Luke 3.3, 3, and he came into all the district around the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And then again, uh, we have uh, Matthew 26.28, for this is my blood of the covenant that uh, is poured out for many for the forgive for and this is say the forgiveness but for forgiveness of sin it's slightly different so what we're going to focus on is mark 1 4 and luke 3 3 where it says uh, the exact same phrase that's used exact same greek construction exact same phraseology that's used in acts 238 so now let's let's go over this a little if acts 238 is teaching that baptism is necessary for salvation and the phrase for the forgiveness of sins means that that's how you obtain salvation then the exact same phrase used in Mark 1 4 and Luke 3 3 about John the Baptist baptizing them for the forgiveness of sins then that would mean then if the phrase for the forgiveness of sins means you obtain forgiveness of sins by that baptism then it would mean then that John the Baptist's baptism got you forgiveness of sins that those people who were baptized in uh, John the Baptist baptism were then forgiven. This is what I ask people. Does it mean then for the forgiveness of sins means to obtain forgiveness of sins? Does it then mean that uh, in, in Mark 1 4 Luke 3 3 that uh, John the Baptist baptized for the forgiveness of sins that they were forgiven? If they say yes then I ask them well did they have to get baptized again in the Trinity later on? It's just a question, and then we talk about what they might say, yes or no. Or how about this question? If they were forgiven of their sins by that baptism, then did they have to go into the temple to offer any more sacrifices since they're forgiven of their sins by the baptism of John the Baptist, but the New Covenant wasn't, still, wasn't instituted with the blood of Christ had been offered that cleanses us of our sins. So what do they do? Because if they're forgiven of their sins, they don't need to go offer sacrifices in the temple. But if they're not forgiven, then they need, they need to. So are they supposed to offer the sacrifices or not? This is a very difficult question for them to answer. They haven't thought of that. So uh, this is uh, these are some of the things that I, I, I will quiz them on and then teach them on, on that, that stuff about what it really is getting at. So there's a lot on Acts 2.38 that a lot of people don't get and uh, questions that are related to the Greek uh, ace, epicen, uh for the forgiveness of sins, which is used elsewhere in uh, Mark 1, 4 and Luke 3, 3 in, reflect, re, uh, in regard to John the Baptist baptism. Let's get to Elijah from Pennsylvania. Elijah, welcome. You're on the air. 
Hey Matt, uh, uh, I I uh, have a question for you. Um, okay. So uh, I'm I, I the same guy who sent you the video uh, a few weeks ago about the uh, preacher rapture. You said it was too long to watch. So I'm here to present yep. you a, another argument that he brought up in that video, and I would like to know what you think about it. Sure. Okay. Let's so, go through it slowly then. Sure. Um, I'm sorry, say that again? Yeah, let's, go, let's go through it slowly and take a look. So I'm looking at Isaiah 26. So now where do we go? Yeah, um, his verses are in Isaiah twenty six nineteen through twenty one, and let's read it. Let's take, so, let's take a look. Nineteen through twenty one. That your dead will live, their corpses will rise. You who lie in the dust, awake and shout for joy, for your dew is as the dew of the dawn, and the earth will give birth to the departed spirits. Ooh. Come, my people, enter into your rooms and close your doors behind you. Hide for a little while until the indignation runs its course. For behold, the Lord is about to come out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity, and the earth will reveal her bloodshed and will no longer uh, uh, cover her slain. Okay, go ahead. Yes, yeah, so his argument is that the the chambers or the rooms in verse 20 that God tells his his people to go into uh, he said that he believes that's referring to uh, uh, marital chambers so like mm -hmm. like like so, so he thinks it's referring to like the marriage supper of the lamb so God's telling them to go in there and uh, and uh, wait and uh, he believes that uh, he, he said that it's clear this is return this is talking about uh, end times uh, of return of the Lord day of judgment on the wicked and uh and uh, he said that this is proof that it's talking about preacher rapture because he said in verse 19 it says the dead rise and he says well the dead rises at the second coming of jesus at the rapture and then he also says um he also points out um yeah he, yeah so he said that's the rapture right there but then god tells the people to go into their into their inner rooms or chambers and to, 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 uh, until his wrath is passed by and then in verse 21 uh, the Lord uh, punishes the wicked, and then uh, it says the earth will disclose the blood that is shed on it. And uh, and uh, that reminds me of the verse in uh, I think it's Second Peter, well, well I think it's chapter three, where where it says in some translations that uh that uh, the earth will will uncover uncover the sins or, or the sure. blood or something like that. Well, hold on, we got a break coming up, and let's talk about it afterwards, okay? All right, we'll be right back. Okay. Hey folks, hold on. We'll be right back after these messages. Please stay tuned. It's Matt Slick Live, taking your calls at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. Everybody, welcome back to the show. Hope you're enjoying it. Let's get to Elijah. You still there, Butter? Yep, I'm still here. All right. Okay, so I think that this is a, 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 a one of the better verses that people can go to in support of pre-tribulation rapture. I think it's one of the better areas. But does it prove pre-trib? Well, some are going to say yes and maybe not. So the chambers, come my people, enter into your rooms and close your doors behind you. Hide for a little while until the indignation runs its course. That's exactly what happened, for example, uh, in uh, the time of God's judgment upon Egypt, when they went into their own chambers, their own homes, and they were there during it. They were right there in the midst of the tribulation period, in the, I mean the tribulation, in the judgment of God upon the nation around them, and they were in it, but they were protected while they were in their inner chambers. So we know that's historical. Now, is that what this is referring to? It may or may, or may not be. And he goes on, he says, For behold, the Lord is about to come out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. And the earth will, be re will reveal her bloodshed and will no longer cover the slain. So... You know, I could see why people would go to this and say, you know what, I think this is, is the rapture. Well, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Now, to back up, your dead will live, their corpses will rise, you who lie in the dust awake and shout for joy, 
for your dew is the dew of the dawn, and the earth will give birth to the departed spirits. So, as you said, what they're going to say about this is that's the, the resurrection that occurs of the dead before the rapture occurs. This is out of 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through chapter 5, verse 2. It says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together in the air in the clouds. So some people are, are relating uh, that idea of the rapture to this. And let's work with that. Let's see. Your dead will live, your corpse will rise, and you will lie in the dust, awake and shout for joy. For your dew is the dew of the dawn, and the earth will give birth to the departed spirits. And then come my people enter in your room. So they say that's the, re the resurrection of the, of the good and then the rapture occurs. They say, see, it fits the order. Well, that would work if it wasn't for Matthew 13. In Matthew 13, 30, uh, allow both to go together. That's the, um, the wicked and the, the good, the wheat and the tares, all right? Allow both to go together until the harvest. And Jesus says, in the time of the harvest, I'll say to the reapers, first gather the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them up. But gather the wheat into my barn. That's the rapture. The harvest is when God collects his people. And he, uh, Jesus then interprets the parable and says in verse uh, uh, 39, the enemy who sowed the tares is a devil and the harvest is the end of the age. The reapers are the angels. Just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be the, at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth his angels will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks. And those who commit lawlessness will throw them into the furnace of fire. Now, the point I'm trying to make here is that what Jesus says is that at the harvest time, which we know is the rapture, the first ones taken are the wicked, not the good. This blows a lot of people's mind when they they see this. And I show it to people and they and they're like their eyebrows just shoot up. And they're like, what? And there it is. So, if we understand the clear teaching of what the New Testament says, that the wicked are taken first and they're taken to judgment, and then the, uh, we know from 1 Thessalonians 4 that those who died in faith are resurrected and then the rapture occurs, then we know that the order here is that uh, it looks like the wicked are the ones taken first, then the resurrection of the good, and then the rapture of those who remain. That seems to be the order from what Jesus himself teaches. Now, if we go back to Isaiah 26, and starting at, at uh, 19, your dead will live, your, your, their corpses will arise. You who lie in the dust, awake and shout for joy. If that's the resurrection of the good, then it means then that the resurrection of the, or the judgment of the bad has already taken place. And he goes, oh, come in. Uh, my people enter into your rooms and close your doors behind you hide for a little while till the kingdom runs its course the indignation runs its course well if this is the pre-trib rapture and seven years is going to happen and then that's when and then Jesus comes back for the judgment then it doesn't fit what Jesus said because he said the first was taken of the wicked at the end of the age which is when the rapture occurs so when we go to Isaiah 26, we have a problem making it fit into what Jesus himself taught. And so that's why I brought up earlier that the people of the, the Jews who were in the nation of, of Egypt during the tribulation of the people upon the wicked, the good, the people of God were in it and in their rooms in it. In their abodes, they were kept safe during that time. So if that is biblical, and he says, come, my people, enter into your rooms and close your doors behind you. Hide for a little while till your indignation runs course. If they want to say it's the rapture, then they have to conclude from Matthew 13 that the, we, the wicked are taken first. And would they then say the wicked are taken first here in Isaiah 26, and if they, they, they say no, the wicked are not, then it doesn't fit the timeline that Jesus has given, because he says, the uh, behold, the Lord is about to come out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth. 
So that's the indignation, the judgment, of which it looks like the Jews will be there, because that's what he's talking about, during that period of time. And if it's the whole world later, then the Christians are going to be there during it, just as the Jews were there during it, during the time of, of Israel, when they went into their houses. Okay? See? So it's not as clear as they wanted to say. Be Okay? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I yeah, I was thinking maybe maybe the um, the uh, rooms could be referring to the rooms of the the uh, New Jerusalem that uh, comes out of heaven. But I think I might be getting my timeline mixed up because I think that probably happens uh, after um, the rapture. But I'm not really sure. Yeah. So the thing is that if someone were to use only that verse, they could make the case for it. And as I say to people, I think there's strength and weaknesses to every position, every eschatological position. And I think this is a, a an area of scripture that is a strength for the pre-tribbers. However, when I show them, for example, Matthew 24, Luke 17, two men are in the field, one is taken, one is left. I show them that that's the wicked who are taken. And then I show them in Matthew 13 that the wicked are taken before the good are taken then this has to be at the end of the age when the judgment of the wicked occurs which means it can only be after the tribulation period it's just it, they have to fit the whole thing and not just uh, one or two verses you see okay yeah um also also the other day i had i had read uh, uh, zechariah chapter 14 and uh you know mm -hmm. i think I, th I think this is now one of my favorite chapters in the Bible because I love reading about you know end times mm -hmm. prophecy and um, mm -hmm. and uh, this entire chapter is about that um uh, this seems to this seems to like go against the uh, the all millennial p position because I know that you accept that but mm -hmm. um this this seems to support an actual mill millennial reign of Christ and um I can't oh, oh I think it's over here and um towards the end of the, the uh, chapter because uh, somewhere around here it talks about the, uh, chapter, I mean verse 19 it talks about um, it, it says this will be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations that do not go up and celebrate the festival of tabernacles and then it goes on to say I think in, or in previous or verses after that about you know people who don't come the nations that don't come to worship the Lord on the earth in those days uh, of rain will not fall on their land and, uh, and uh, all this other stuff so it seems to be that there are still sinful people on earth at this time when the Lord is the Lord is reigning on the earth. So this seems to support an actual thousand year reign of Christ on the earth. So I would like to know your thoughts on Zechariah fourteen. Well it uh, says the punishment of Egypt. That means Egypt is is a nation that's being discussed that's going to be punished. Is this is it future? Is it a thousand year reign issue when the punishment of Egypt occurs? But if they want to say that Egypt is not literally this Egypt, uh, well, then then they can't say that it's literal uh, 1,000 years in the millennium. If they say, well, it is Egypt, then we have to deal with what context, because it's the sin of Egypt. And what was the sin of Egypt? Well, in part, it was the punishment or the enslavement of the people of, of Israel. So this will be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations who do not go up to the uh, Feast of the Booths. Well, we Christians don't celebrate the Feast of the Booths. So now is it going to say the punishment is occurring to the, to the Christians now? So to say that this is uh, millennial, ha already just right from the beginning has problems. Hey, we've got a break. Hold on, buddy. Hey, folks, we'll be right back after these messages. Please stay tuned. It's Matt Slick Live, taking your calls at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. Let's get back on with Elijah, then we'll get to Warren, who wants to talk about baptism. So let's give another couple of minutes here, uh, Elijah. Okay, so did that help any? Yeah, that helped, helped some, but um, uh, well, while we were on break, I... Uh, when earlier in the chapter, I went to I found uh, Zechariah fourteen verse eight, and it says, "On that day, living water will flow out of Jerusalem, half of it east to the Dead Sea, and half of it west to the Mediterranean Sea, in summer and winter." And the cross reference here in my Bible 
uh, cross-references uh, this verse uh, with Revelation 22, 1 to 2. So, so um, uh, that's why I say this chapter seems to be referring to the, uh, the uh, millennial reign of Christ on the earth during, like, a New Jerusalem. Yeah, I could see uh, why they would say that. Um, and half went one direction, half went the other, but in Revelation 22, it doesn't talk about that. What it does talk about in Revelation 22 is that the river of water of life, this is very symbolic. Uh, as clear as as crystal. Now this is referencing or uh, in the Old Testament of Exodus uh, 24, 9 through 11, where Moses, Aaron, Nabon, and Abihu went up and saw the God of Israel, and his, uh, his feet were on a, a crystal sea. So this is referencing the throne work of God, and this is very, uh, it, it's very important for that, the tree of life, the spiritual aspect. So in Zechariah, that day, living waters will flow out of Jerusalem. Now, we have to ask the question, uh, is it literally the city of Jerusalem? Because if they're going to say in the millennial kingdom, and they say Jerusalem is, is literal, and waters go north and south, or excuse me, uh, east uh, and west, they're living waters. Well, to be honest, what does it mean to say living waters flow out of the city of Jerusalem and one goes towards the western sea and one towards the eastern and are living waters so if that's the case that we ask these questions I don't see it being literal in that these waters are living and that if you drink them you're gonna have a life or whatever uh, because of it and to relate it to Revelation 22 which is speaks about uh, this spiritual aspect of God's throne and the water of life which is symbolic I, I have a problem connecting them with a cross-reference. And if we go back to Zechariah thir uh, 14, 8, uh, and we say, if it's a literal, like I said, a literal Jerusalem and a literal waters, then why are they called living waters? I mean, these are just questions you've got to ask. And I, what I, I notice a lot of people do is they don't ask very many questions. They'll say, for example, you know, like in the cross-reference you cited, well, the day the living waters flow out of Jerusalem. So you see, that's about the millennial kingdom. And it's referenced with Revelation 22, which is the water of life. Well, then they stop thinking. Start asking questions. <laughs> and, and see, well, wait a minute. Do they relate to each other? Are they just using symbols? Is it identical or what? And people, in my, I'm amazed. They just, they see what they like. Oh, I'm done thinking. That's what it means. And then I come along and ask questions, and they don't know what to do with them. Do you see the problem there? Okay. All right, buddy. Yeah. Uh, yep. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, some people think that the river of, of the water of life of Revelation 22 uh, is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. Uh, 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 what do you think about that? I don't know. Because it's symbolic. They can think it's symbolic of the Holy Spirit. Maybe it is. But maybe it's not. This is why I say with people, if you're going to make an eschatological position, don't use it, don't, don't develop it out of the places of symbology. Develop it out of the places that are hardcore direct. The, this age, the age to come, when the trumpet occurs, when the, uh, the voice of the archangel occurs, what happens at the end of the age? You just map them out and that changes things. But what people do for the rapture, pre-trib that I've found, is go to places that are symbolic and then they try and read literalness into the symbolism instead of doing it the other way around. Okay? All right, buddy? Okay. All right. All right, man. Okay, God bless. Have a good one. All you right. too. All right, now let's get to Warren. Thanks for waiting, Warren. So what do you got, buddy? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. You were talking earlier uh, about uh, the book of Acts, baptismal. Mm -hmm. um, um, I actually enjoyed mm -hmm. hearing your previous caller there. There was some good points you brought out there um and i've listened to you very frequently quite a bit i've never called in i am in ministry but i just want to get your viewpoints to possibly help the body of christ that in that acts 238 baptism like you were talking about earlier did that some people have to go back later and get baptized in the trinity and because of the doctrines that we have all across the body of christ across the world were separated when Psalms tells us the Lord wishes that we would all dwell in unity. So for the edification, I wanted to get your viewpoints on 
if I have an apostolic ministry and somebody that's come in has been baptized in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, personally, I don't think it's right for me to not receive them in love as a brother or sister in the Lord to encourage them to be baptized another way because I think doctrinally, according to the Word, it is biblical, it is written. Shouldn't the well, body maybe receive one another me. in love? If they... you, you, hold on, you're yes, confusing sir? me a little bit. Um, so, yes, they should be baptized. If they're baptized the Trinitarian formula, then they don't need to be baptized again. Not a problem. So I'm not sure what you're getting at, though. Right. My question in relation to what you just understood, what I was stating, is that I think as a man of God, as a Christian, mm -hmm. in ministry, I should receive any person that's been baptized that's already received the Lord as their Savior, confessed Him as God, Lord, yeah. came in the flesh. Yeah. You know, I, I think if I'm an apostolic doctrine church, or even if I'm a Trinitarian church, and someone comes into whoa, a whoa, fold whoa, whoa, of whoa, whoa, the whoa, ministry whoa, whoa, wait, 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 hold on, hold on. You said if you're an apostolic church, yes, or even a Trinitarian church. That implies then that the apostolic church you're, you're affirming in is not Trinitarian. At that point, i got to stop and say, what do you mean? Well, yes, sir. Exactly. Uh, some of the comments earlier that you were making, because of the doctrinal differences of the different denominations in today's body of believers across the world, if you go okay. to a Acts well, 238 baptism in the name of Jesus Christ, you were just talking that's, about that's that. It's a false baptism. If they do the formula in the name of Jesus, and that's how they're baptized, then that's a false baptism. It's not obeying Christ. If you're talking about apostolic stuff like United Apostolic, where they deny the Trinity, they're not even Christian. Right, okay. because they encourage people to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins. I think you just yeah, explained no. that to a caller before. Yes, sir? No, I'm saying that the oneness Pentecostal, the people who deny the Trinity and believe that God is only one person and add works to salvation by baptism and or speaking in tongues, they're not Christian. It's a, it's a cult. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Right. Right. I understand what you're saying. That's what I'm. Okay. That's the reason I'm approaching you this way instead of just asking you a simple question. Because I, I do value your intelligence and how you help so many people. So. I was just trying to get you, because you are on the air, to bring clarity to people that are believers in the scriptures in that area. Okay. Just, um, you know, okay. I appreciate it. You know, I do. Yeah. Well, I do try and teach Because we have a lot of that. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, you, you're awesome. I mean, you know, like, you, like I'm saying and like you're saying, there is a lot of division because a lack of clarity of the proper understanding of the Word of God. Okay. I'm, I'm just asking yeah. this so people will think about where they are so they can come more wholeheartedly with a clarity of thought of where they mm -hmm. are and who they are in Christ. That's right. That's one of the things we're hoping to do by teaching so, the Word of Truth in the, on the radio. Yeah. So praise God. And you're okay. doing a great job, and you are right now, too. <laughs> All right. Well, well I thank you for taking my call. Lord bless sure, you. Sure, no problem, brother. Okay, God bless. All right, now let's get to next longest waiting is Mona. Mona, welcome. You're on the air. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, I can. So what do you got? All right. I, I don't know how much you're going to let me say on the air, but um, if Kamala Harris gets to be president, the heads of these other countries are not going to deal with her because she's not acting like a woman and she's not dressing like a woman. And my proof of that is when Sarai question? went to Abram and said, yes. Do you have a question about this, though, or what? No, I just wanted to approach women at large and say that we need to start acting like women and start dressing like women and not acting like what God would call a harlot. And we're going to see this if Kamala Harris gets to be president. Wow. Um, and the country's not going to deal comments. with us. 
But uh, I tell you what, if you can form a question, though, we can talk about something that would be worth doing. So why don't you, <laughs> you know, th- review all that and then develop a question out of it and call back and we can we can talk about it. Okay, we appreciate that. Let's get to Leroy from Virginia. Leroy, welcome. You're on the air. Leroy, Leroy, buddy. Hey. Leroy, yeah. you're on the air. How you doing? I'm doing all right, man. What okay. do you got, buddy? Uh, yeah, buddy. Um, your name Max Slip, right? <laughs> yes. Yep. <laughs> okay. 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 So, uh, I, I've been listening for a while, and can you explain about Acts two thirty eight, please? Because I heard a lot of people ask a lot of questions about baptism, and there was, you know, a couple of people at the last one talking about Acts two thirty eight. And the Trinity. I mean, it's between Acts two to two thirty eight and the Trinity. Can you explain both of them, please? We don't. We only have two minutes, so it's gonna be difficult to get those. Okay, both well, in two minutes but, because you uh, go ahead. But I, I was gonna say you could call back tomorrow. We can talk about them. But in the meantime, uh, Acts two thirty eight is not a formula for salvation. A lot of That's people say. A go ahead. lot of. A lot of people say it is, but you ask a question. Is it a formula for salvation? If they say yes, then you ask them. If it's a formula for salvation, then why is faith not mentioned? If it's a formula, if it's what you do to get saved, why is faith not mentioned in there? That's the first question you got to ask. If they say it's implied, you say, but it's not mentioned. You said it was a formula, but it's not, is it? If they say, baptize in the name of Jesus, that's simply a phrase that's used in Acts 4 7 to designate the authority of someone. Like, stop in the name of the law, baptize in the name of Jesus. And how they're baptized is by quoting what Jesus said to do in Matthew 28 19 20, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And it says, for the forgiveness of sins, it doesn't mean you obtain the forgiveness of sins there. Because the phrase, for the forgiveness of sins, is used in Mark 1 4 and. and uh, uh, Luke, oh, I forget what it was, Mark 1, 4, specifically, where it says uh, John the Baptist baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Does that mean that John's baptism gave them forgiveness of sins? And if so, did they need to get baptized again later in, in the Trinitarian baptism? Did they need to offer sacrifices? There are all kinds of problems with that position. And we're out of time, brother. Sorry about that. Call back tomorrow. We can talk some more about it because it's worth getting into. Yes, all right, brother? Okay. Yeah, yes, sir, I will. All okay, right. Bro. God, God bless. Okay, Alberto, go. got to call back tomorrow also. Hey, may the Lord bless you all by his grace. We're back on there tomorrow, and we'll talk to you then. Have a great evening. Another program powered by the Truth Network.